Hello everyone, in this video we'll be going through the foundations of audio in Unity. For those of you who are new to the topic, it's probably going to be pretty dense with information, however it'll be good to get a solid understanding of how audio works within the engine. So let's get straight to it. If we click on the main camera, we'll see that it has an audio listener. Every scene that has sound needs one of these. The listener is what will pick up sound from any of the audio sources in your game and send it to your speakers. Unity will throw us a warning message if we have more than one audio listener in a scene, so if you do need multiple cameras or audio sources, remember to disable any inactive ones and ensure that you only have one enabled at any given time. So I've got a folder here with a group of sounds which are all in WAV format. It's a good idea to use an uncompressed file like WAV and let Unity handle the compression and the encoding. In saying that, Unity supports a good number of audio formats that you can use. So now with the file selected, you can see all of its import properties in the inspector, along with a preview of the waveform down the bottom. I'll go through and I'll give a brief explanation for each of these settings. The first one is Force to Mono, so you can see here that the Nature Ambient Sound has two channels, one for the left speaker and one for the right speaker. If we hit Force to Mono and then hit Apply, you'll see that Unity has combined both channels down into one. Along with that, the imported size has gone from 1.9 megabytes to just a couple hundred kilobytes. Now that is a great practice for optimization as Unity only needs to process one channel. And in a 3D environment, the origin of the sound is from a single point in space. So it will be mixed down into one anyway, depending on the audio source's position relative to the player. The next setting is load in background which causes the audio files to load on a separate thread and take some of the weight off the main thread. Now keep in mind that we don't want to use this checkbox for any sounds that you might need at the beginning of a scene like music or ambience because the sound cannot play until it's fully loaded in memory. Ambisonic is predominantly used for VR and 360 videos and I won't go into detail about this setting here but I have linked to the topic in Unity's documentation if you want to learn more about how to use ambisonic sounds. And next we have the compression settings, and there's quite a bit to go through here. Changing these will vastly affect the optimization of the audio. So if we hit the override checkbox here and hit apply, it will allow us to edit all of these settings. The load type is how Unity will load assets in at runtime. The first one is decompress on load, and this means that Unity will store the compressed file on the disk and will decompress and load it onto the RAM when the game starts. This method uses the least amount of CPU out of the options, however it does take up the most memory space. Next one is compressed in memory, which will store the compressed audio on the RAM and use the CPU to decompress it each time it's played. So there is a trade-off between memory usage and CPU usage. This setting will take slightly more CPU power, however it will free up a good amount of RAM. Streaming is stored on the disk and will decode and decompress audio on the fly. This method uses the least amount of RAM, however it does have the highest impact on the CPU usage. Because of this, it's not recommended to do it on more than a couple audio clips at a time. Now next is the compression format. The first one we have is PCM, which is the raw audio data, and it results in a higher quality sound. It's best used for very short sound effects and UI sounds. The next one is Vorbis, which is the default in Unity. Now this results in a smaller file at the cost of a slightly lower quality of sound compared to the PCM. With Vorbis you can adjust the level of compression using this slider here. And if you're using AD PCM, the audio will have some minor noise artifacts in it. So it's best used for sounds with a fair bit of noise in the clip itself, such as footsteps or gunshots. This format will result in the smallest file and it will be the fastest to run. And the last thing in the compression settings, we have the sample rate. So in this we have preserve sample rate, optimize and override. So preserve will use the sample rate that the file was made with. Optimize will get Unity to analyze the audio data and select the lowest sample rate possible without losing any quality. And override will allow you to choose your own sample rate. Now I wouldn't recommend this option unless you're 100% sure which is the best setting for your audio. 
And that covers it for the compression settings. As you can tell, there is quite a lot to know in just these few options. So I've linked some really helpful articles if you want to learn more about how to best optimize the audio in your game. All right, so to actually get a sound to play in Unity, we need to create an audio source. We can do this by going Create, Audio, and Audio Source. This places a new game object in the hierarchy with an audio source component. If we inspect the properties of an audio source, you can see that at the top we have an audio clip. This is where we assign all of our audio files. So let's drag one of the audio files up into the spot here. Now I've got a script here which just looks for a simple input like the S key and plays a one-shot sound. Now we'll get into some more advanced coding techniques in the future, but this is just to demonstrate some of the settings. The next option is called Output and it needs an audio mixer group. Now we'll come back to the audio source in a minute, but first let's talk about the audio mixer window. The audio mixer window can be found by going up to Window, Audio and Audio Mixer and that will open up a new tab for us. So you can see that we've got no mixers found at the moment, but if we hit this little plus button here, we can create a new audio mixer and I'm going to name mine Main Mixer. And now that's given us a few more sections to have a look at. So we've got snapshots, groups, and views. First up, we want to have a look at groups because that is what we're going to plug into the output of our audio source. Now a group is like a channel that an audio source will play through. Right now we just have the master group. So let's create another three groups here. One called sound effects, one called music, and one called speech and we've got them all parented under the master group there. So if we've got some voice acting where our characters are giving some dialogue, we can assign their audio sources into the speech group. And with a bit of UI and programming, we can set up a way for players to adjust the volumes of each of these in game, which we'll cover in a later video. So let's say we have a section of a level which is set in a large tunnel, and you want all the sounds in the area to have the same echoing effect. In order to do this, we can create another group and we'll parent it under the sound effects group here and we can call it tunnel. And because it's parented to the sound effects, if we change the volume of our sound effects channel, it will also affect the tunnel group and any other sound effects that are parented to it. So I'll just make the audio mixer window a little bit bigger. So at the bottom of the tunnel channel, we'll hit the add button. That'll give us a list of all the audio effects that we can put on a group. So we'll add the echo effect here. And I'm going to change some of the values here to get a nice echo sound. And we'll also add in a sound effects reverb. And we'll change some of the settings here. Now before we add the tunnel group to the output, let's have a listen to what it sounds like without any effects on it. Now you'll notice that it's not running through any of our channels down in the audio mixer window. And that's because we haven't assigned the group yet. We click on the button next to output and we'll put it in the sound effects group. We can hear that it still doesn't have the sound effects on there. It's running through the sound effects and the master channels, but it's not running through the tunnel channel. So if we run it through the tunnel channel, now it's got the echo and the reverb on there. Pretty cool, huh? And now any other audio sources that we add the tunnel group to will have the same effects on it. And that's pretty much everything for the groups. Now a snapshot will save all of the values for the effects on your groups. So if we create a new snapshot here, and we'll call this effects extreme. And we just go crazy with all of these settings. So let's see what that sounds like. So that's our snapshot. If we go edit in play mode, we can go to effect extreme and hit the S key. Oh. <laughs> well, there you go. There's a quick way to make a bomb sound. Okay. And um, finally views 
Uh, very similar to snapshots, except instead of saving values on the effects, you're saving your layout in the mixer. So if we create a new view, we'll call this just speech. And we turn everything off except for speech in the groups here using a little eyeball. Then you can see that we've got our, our two different views here. Now you can use this to save all of your most important groups into a particular layout. Okay, so back to the audio source properties. The next one after output is the mute button. Then we have a bypass effects button. Now this is used when we add an effect filter to the actual game object that the audio source is on. So if we go to add component and type in filter, anything ending in the word filter is an effect that we can add to this audio source. So we'll throw in a high pass filter and we'll change that down to 2000 and we'll hit play. You can hear that the sound still has a echo and reverb on there, but it also has the high pass as well, cutting off all of the lower frequencies. So if we hit the bypass effects button and we hit S again, then we're bypassing this effect down here. Now keep in mind that it won't bypass anything on the tunnel group, only what's on the game object itself. So we'll talk about reverb zones in another video. Next we have play on awake, and that will make the sound play as soon as the game starts. Loop will cause the sound to constantly repeat, so using both of these settings, we can easily set up some ambient loops or some simple music loops. Priority gives more importance to audio sources with a smaller number, which may cause audio sources with a greater number to be cut off if they're playing at the same time. And volume will obviously change how loud or soft this audio source is and pitch will change the frequency that the sound is played through the audio source. So if we hit play, we can lower the pitch, or we can raise the pitch. Stereo pan adjusts how much the sound plays through the left or the right speaker. So we've got left speaker, and we've got the right speaker. The stereo pan will only work when the spatial blend is set to the 2D side. If we set the spatial blend to 3D, then our audio source is affected by the 3D space. And the sound will play through the left or the right speaker depending on the position of the audio source in relation to the audio listener. So, for example, we'll change our audio clip to be the nature ambience, and we'll set the output to be the sound effects. Now if we hit play, and we loop the sound. When we move the audio source to the left hand side, we can see that it's only coming through the left speaker. Now if we move it to the center, it fades in between the both of them, and if we move it to the right, it will only play through the right speaker. So that demonstrates what I was saying earlier about forcing sounds to mono. When the sound is in a 3D space, you're either hearing it through the left or the right speaker, unless you're standing right on top of the sound. So if you do have any sound effects pre-baked, that's the only way that you're going to hear them. The Doppler level will adjust the pitch depending on the audio source's velocity relative to the player's position. So if the sound is zooming away from the player, then the sound will be pitched down. And likewise, if it is zooming towards the player, then the sound will pitch up. So we'll hit play and we'll go to our scene view. Now we can see that the audio source is below and behind the camera. So if we move the audio source up and back a bit to simulate a car driving past and then we move it past the player. So it's kind of hard to hear but if we bump this up to 5 and try again And likewise, if the camera is moving towards the audio source. And that is the Doppler effect. Now, if we put the audio source back on top of the camera, 
and move it to one side. Now the spread slider lets you adjust how much the 3D positioning affects the panning of the sound. So if you have this at zero, then the panning is determined completely by the 3D position. As you can see, it is on the right hand side and it is coming through the right hand speaker. So if you have this at 180, then you can see that it's playing through both speakers and the 3D positioning will only affect the volume of the sound. And then anything over 180 will start to reverse the panning of the sound. So if we bump this up to a full 360, then you can see that the sound is playing through the left channel, even though it is on the right side. Next, we have the volume roll off. Now this is represented on the graph here with this red curve. At the moment, we've got it set to linear roll off. So if we set this back to logarithmic, then you can see that it's updated this graph down here. Now the graph has the distance that the audio source is from the audio listener on the X axis and the volume on the Y axis. So if we change the max distance down to something like 20, and you can see that it's updated with the new values and we can visualize how loud the sound is going to be at any given distance. So if we move the audio source away from the audio listener, then the sound will currently be playing at something like 0.1. And if we move it closer, then it will play at half the volume, at 0.5 of the full volume. You also get a visual representation of the min and max distance in the scene. So around the audio source are two spheres. The inner sphere is the minimum distance. So anything inside this inner sphere will be played at full volume. Then in between the inner sphere and outer sphere, the audio source will start to fall off. Then once you get outside the outer sphere, providing that the last point on the x-axis is down at zero, then you will no longer be able to hear the sound. So if we hit play, and we start to move the audio source further away from the audio listener, you can see that it's reaching the outer sphere, and you can no longer hear the sound. Okay, so that was quite a bit to go through, but hopefully now you have a better understanding of how audio works within the engine. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and in the next video, I'll be going into playing some random sounds from a list and varying the attributes of those sounds in order to avoid any annoying repetition. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.